name's Andy Ram Gobin, and I'm a Principal Technology Evangelist uh, for TechniMove. I want to take you on a journey through the technology landscape and talk about some of the key principles, as well as showcase some stories in healthcare industry from some of the large technology vendors. I've had the pleasure of working for small companies turning over 1 million to large global corporates with 86 offices in 34 countries. So I've got a huge range of experience um, from dealing with small to medium size enterprises and designing and delivering complex solutions for some of the biggest businesses in the world. Uh, my role is to go into a customer and extrapolate all the information about their business, their IT platform, and to help them stitch together their existing investments while building a technology roadmap for the next three to five years and providing that customer with a genuine transformation plan. So you can see there's quite a lot of information on this slide and if you're a non-technical person or non-IT person, then this probably doesn't mean too much to you. Um, but this is a gra graphical representation of my 11 years in IT and it covers most things that SMEs and enterprises should be focusing on. However, there are a lot of things like business intelligence, ERP, customer and digital experience that I just simply couldn't fit onto the image. Listed as some of the traditional key areas of focus, infrastructure, cloud, networking, security, end user compute, and then things like that are growing like automation, data warehousing, AI and machine learning, um, and edge computing. DevOps is another area that's got a huge amount of focus thanks to the rise of continuous integration and continuous delivery at Kubernetes and containers. Uh, this framework and tool set allows you to automate development pipelines uh, whilst allowing every dev to collaborate on the latest version of the code. Uh, that pipeline needs to be secured right from the planning stage all the way through to the monitoring stage. And anyone in security knows that this is called the shift left proposition. Um, that then leads into what we call full stack observability. So hopefully you can start to see that all of these areas are interlinked. And to leverage the benefit of one technology area, you have to deploy multiple technology areas. Full stack cybersecurity is extremely pertinent in today's world, and I want to focus the next few slides in that area. There are a number of frameworks, governance, and educational organizations out there to help businesses protect against cyber breaches and attacks. MITRE Attack Framework, which is a highly detailed and cross-referenced repository about real-world adversary groups and their known behavior and tactics. OWASP is another organization um, geared towards preventing web application attacks. And the world-renowned OWASP Top 10 attacks is widely used by enterprises deploying web applications, firewalls, and other security tools. Um, critical security controls run by the uh, Center of Internet Security. Uh, it's another one that is all around security benchmarking and patching. And Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain is geared towards intelligent-driven defense. And you're going to start to hear in the next 12 months, a lot of people talking about getting in the mindset of a hacker and understanding what their step chain attack is um, and how they'll go about breaching your business. And as you can see, this is the cyber kill chain. Uh, reconnaissance is harvesting email addresses um, and conference information. Uh, weaponization is coupling an exploit with a backdoor um, and then changing that into a deliverable payload and then delivering that as an, a weaponized bundle to the victim either by a USB, web or email. You're then able to exploit the vulnerability and execute code on a victim system, moving to command and control, which allows for remote manipulation of the victim system. Hands-on actions is effectively where the intruder can do exactly what they set out to do. And that could be the exfiltration of critical sensitive data for a dark, da dark web data dump. If someone wants to hack you, they will hack you. This is about taking a breach will happen mindset there are, however, a number of tools and strategies that can bolster your defences and harden your security posture. Endpoint detection response, something that we call EDR tools, can be deployed along web security for users um, and using things like identity access management, privilege access management coupled with multi-factor authentication, phishing defence and simulation defence. And when we talk about phishing simulation, that's where we can actually phish our own staff automated so that we can see who needs to be trained more and what provide a human risk register. And each month you can push a bite-sized five-minute video to that trainer, uh, that user. Uh, what we found in the last four years is if you start trying to push a 45-minute video on any user that's non-IT, um, they tend to watch it once, never return to it. And ultimately, you know, people are your, you know, your weakest attack vector. 
insecurity, you know, but ultimately the security revolves around people, process and policies. Um, deploying a robust RBAC strategy, that's role-based access controls, um, using secure bastion jump hosts um, with MFA or secure reverse proxies. And this stops users connecting directly to applications via SSH or RDP. And these are the bedrock of a strong security posture, along with things like patching. In security, we talk about the attack surface widening. Uh, and if you look at digital transformation, we're trying to exponentially grow the consumption of data, which means that the security risk grows accordingly. And that journey needs to be secured end to end. In the past 12 months, I've recovered two global businesses from ransomware attacks, and I can honestly say the experience is not good for anyone's health. Um, although both businesses were very different and had very different attack vectors, um, the, what I realized is that very few companies have a breach response plan, um, and when the worst happens, no one knows what their roles and responsibilities are. You know, forget about technology. You can put as much technology in as you want, but when the worst happens, everyone's running around, and then no one knows what to do. There were no simulations, no testing, no run books. The fear and stress takes over and it becomes a highly pressurized situation for the staff involved with people worrying for their jobs um, and litigation. Companies think we've been breached. Where are our backups? Are they corrupted? Can we recover from them? How long is that even gonna take? Do we need to fail over to the DR? Um, then the thought turns to, is the attacker still in our environment? Are they moving laterally through our applications and databases? And has any data been exfiltrated? Uh, do we need to contact the ICO? That's when you have a breach for GDPR, um, HIPAA from a healthcare perspective. Um, and what about forensics? You know, they, everyone needs forensics to claim on cyber insurance. So while all of this is going on, you have to do this forensic analysis to be able to claim anything, any money back on your cyber insurance. Cyber warfare simulations and um, breach response plans are one of our mantras at Technimove. Um, ransomware is now seen as one of the most common attacks and it can be one of the most deadly. Uh, effectively, attackers breach your devices, defenses, encrypt your drives, file servers, backup appliance uh, and databases, leaving usually a crude ransom note um, about transferring Bitcoin if you want your data back. Um, Veeam, who are number one in the backup and DR space, coined the term 321 in 2015, and that's all about having three copies of the data, two types of media, and one off-site. Uh, and although things have matured a lot now, we've now got granular backup policies, and things like data resilience strategies are key. Uh, in the last year, we've seen the rise of immutable storage and backups. An immutable backup is something that cannot be altered, it cannot be deleted, encrypted, or changed by either one of your staff from an insider perspective or a malicious outsider threat. Uh, we've just launched our own immutable off-site scale-up backup repository service. But the problem you have with off-site backups, if, if the internet connection goes down, you have no ability to recover those files quickly. So we've also put a hardened on-prem Linux repository that provides immutable backups on-prem. So we can provide ransomware-free backups on-premise and off-premise. And this is all about delivering cyber resilience to our customers. Uh, Cambridge One is the largest UK supercomputer uh, and it's hosted in the Harlow-based campus of Life Sciences focused on the co-location provider CalData. Cambridge One is accelerating health research that spans across medical imaging, genomics and drug discovery with its founding partners AstraZeneca, GSK, Guy's and St Thomas, King's College London and Oxford Nanopore. Cambridge One is dedicated to advancing UK health research through digital biology unlocking a deeper understanding of disease and breakthroughs in medicine. AstraZeneca is powering modern machine learning and AI to accelerate drug discovery with Cambridge One, training models to learn the grammar of chemistry and processing whole slide pathology images. At GSK, um, with the computational resources of Cambridge One, are using advanced machine learning to harness genetic evidence in large databases and develop transformative medicine. Um, King's College London, they're building deep learning models that can synthesize artificial 3D MRI images of human brains. Um, Cambridge One enables accelerated generation of synthetic data so researchers can understand how different vectors affect the brain, anatomy, and pathology. And NVIDIA are really the engine behind the growth of 
AI and machine learning. But in order to leverage this power, you have to understand things like unstructured data lakes, ETL tools, that's extract, transform, and load, and how to query and model data as the two are intertwined and interlinked. Um, AWS, there was a 2013 pilot program sponsored by Philips that found the use that telehealth systems could reduce hospitalizations by 45%, cut acute and long-term care costs by 32%, and reduce overall care costs by 27%. Uh, Philips made a strategic decision to help their customers serve patients, not just in traditional clinical setting, but along a continuum that also supports uh, for healthy living, aging in place, and more effective home care. Philips initially moved 19 petabytes of on-premise medical imaging data to the cloud, and they now store 44 petabytes of data on AWS. Uh, Philips relied on AWS IoT Core for device connectivity, and moving to the cloud allowed them to connect devices using AWS's IoT service, and this meant that their healthcare systems could deliver telemedicine by leveraging the power of AWS IoT Core. And for me, digital transformation is a big buzzword in my industry. Not many people understand it or know what it means. That's including the large tech vendors. Um, but for me, this is the very essence of digital transformation. Uh, this is one of my favorite use cases, actually. Um, so UiPath completed a pro bono automation project for Meta Hospital in Dublin in 2020. Um, RPA, for those that don't know, is robotic process automation. And that's where users can create software robots that learn, mimic, and then execute rule-based tasks. RPA automation enables users to create bots by observing human digital actions. Bots can then interact with any application or system the same way people do, except they work around the clock with 100% accuracy. Um, some of the benefits can be cost savings and faster ROI, greater productivity, um, greater accuracy, customer experience, and integration across all platforms. Um, and Jinsey Jerry, Assistant Director of Nursing, Infection Prevention and Control at MM8UH, um, says that it will save the infection control department three hours a day, 18 hours a week, and 936 hours a year, which they can now spend managing the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Norfolk and Suffolk NHS, um, they needed to ensure the health of data, network, and devices. Um, and needed an external DNS and secure web gateway solution. Um, Cisco are a well-known security network and data center vendor, um, and Cisco Umbrella offers cloud-delivered security when and how you need it. It combines multiple security functions into one solution so that you can extend protection of devices um, to remote users and distributed locations anywhere. Umbrella is the easiest way to effectively protect your users um, in minutes. Your goal is to keep the bad stuff out and the good stuff in. Chasing security alerts from disparate systems wastes your time, money, and strains limited resources. What if you had access to better intelligence and integrated security um, that exposes blind spots while being simple to manage? Um, Dave Jones, Infrastructure Manager at Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust, um, says that Cisco Umbrella has uncovered many potential breaches that they wouldn't have had previous insight into. Uh, Stockport NHS Foundation Trust. Um, this trust sees half a million patients each year at its Stepping Hill Hospital and also operates Devonshire Centre for Neuro Rehabilitation, um, the Swanbourne Gardens Respite Centre and 24 regional health clinics. Um, they employ 5,000 employees um, and they have some standard challenges. They needed to modernise and standardise their data centre infrastructure, um, reduce technology and complexity costs and improve mission critical application performance. So they deployed three types of technology, Cisco Hyperflex, ACI, and Intersight SaaS. Um, Hyperflex is an HCI hyperconverged appliance. Um, ACI is software defined networking security, um, and Intersight is an automation SaaS based platform. Um, the results were they accelerated application performance on life critical applications by 20 times, um, reduced support and licensing costs by nearly 100,000 per year and increased data center security, scalability, and flexibility. Uh, Anura and Bevan University Health Board. Um, this is a network of hospitals in Wales. Um, they employ 14,800 people in 300 departments spread across 120 sites. 
Uh, Two-thirds of their staff are directly involved in patient care, including 1,000 hospitals and general practice doctors, as well as 6,000 nurses, allied healthcare professionals and community workers. Um, they, they tried to deploy and did deploy Cisco to find uh, software to find access, which provides a consistent, dynamic, secure access, and this was to deliver patient care faster. Um, this was effectively to enhance security and compliance and to keep user, device and application traffic separate with end-to-end -end segmentation, uh, delivering a consistent experience by applying a common user policy everywhere across a single fabric on wired and wireless infrastructure, uh, boosting operational efficient effectiveness um, increase, increase agility and efficiency with automated user profiles, uh, policies and network provisioning, uh, and gaining better network insights, getting better visibility and transforming network data into actionable intelligence. Uh, Puppet are a infrastructure automation, config state management um, and security vendor. And whilst they might not be as sexy as the AI, machine learning and automation, they are have got a couple of customers in healthcare and they've noticed some systemic problems which they're trying to solve. And um, some of these key challenges revolve around the IT estate is large, complex and siloed. Inventory management and provisioning and deployment is largely done manually. The use of spreadsheets and long complex scripts is commonplace. Uh, local access needs at sites and limited availability of secure and remo reliable remote access and that can be geographical branch locations with less advanced infrastructure. Um, testing, having to work across highly sensitive mission critical systems. And for most, no ability to create consistent environments that mirror production. Um, as a result of all of the above, updates happen very rarely, increasing the risk of software exploits. Um, some of the consequences that come from these challenges, it's incredibly difficult to control and govern especially when operating across different geographical locations with different regulations. Lack of real-time situational awareness, data quickly becomes outdated, unreliable, and performance is impacted through manual, non-standardized deployments, even resulting in outages. Configuration drift is a negative outcome relating to all of this. Significant human hours and time and expenditure cost to maintain, update, and secure the IT estate with many healthcare providers operating on a limited resources and budgets. Higher human error rates for manual testing result in increased risk of software exploits, outages and data privacy concerns and breaches. Uh, heightened GRC risks, governance risk and compliance, uh, e.g. breaches to GDPR and HIPAA compliance um, from inefficient management and lack of control across the IT estate. But the future can look different. Uh, and with the introduction of a centralized control plane and a robust mechanism for configuration management and full stack automation, and replacing manual script-based efforts with infrastructure as code principles to achieve real-time visibility and reporting, desired state management and enforcement, automatic drift remediation, and faster secure deployments via a controlled self-service. Um, leveraging agent-based automation to remote manage global infrastructure over secure protocols. Introducing continuous delivery, continuous integration and continuous delivery and DevOps principles to modernize working patterns, behaviors, and a way to bridge friction caused by silos, helping to achieve greater consistency and security across the IT fleet. Uh, continuously improve security and compliance posture by introducing these mechanisms to better control, update, and secure the IT estate. And all of that can be done whilst reducing the cost of operations. This slide was actually given to me um, by a very intelligent and experienced gentleman who started working as a nurse um, and worked his way all the way up to a CIO in the NHS. And this is his consolidated view. And he made the move to move out of being a CIO in NHS and moving to being a salesperson at Cisco, one of the biggest technology vendors in the world. And that's really to assist Cisco in tweaking their solution and strategy to deliver more value on their solutions back into the healthcare industry. Um, anyone that does know IT knows that vendors just tell you that you need something um, without listening to your actual requirement. So to enable that foundation, you need a fabric where technology just works. This consists of cybersecurity, integrated networks, integrated data, and sustainable smart buildings. 
Once you have that solid underlying platform, you can start to transform your tactics for releasing time to care, which consists of things like medical device security, identity management, asset tracking, space utilization, and space control. And this phase delivers secure, sustainable smart buildings. Uh, you can then shift towards making care accessible in the most appropriate setting by leveraging a secure digital front door, which in turn delivers prevention, long-term condition management, and remote care. Um, this is some stuff that you probably know a lot more than I do, in complete honesty, um, but there's a few points around integrated care systems, and um, that is that the ICS is forming, which is a statutory body, which will be in place from April 2022. NHSX, and that's the What Good Looks Like guidance and the Unified Technology Fund. And there's new opportunities for things like elective care recovery and new streams of potential taxation revenues. Um, this is actually quite a big passion project for me. It's not on the technology landscape and it's not what I actually do for a living. Um, you're gonna see, I think, Microsoft on this stage later talking about mixed reality and the HoloLens. And there's a guy from Insight that's going to be talking about what that's doing in, in, in the medical space. Um, but everything I've spoken up until now refers back to the technology landscape. The second slide I showed with huge amounts of information on technology on it. And although augmented reality and VR aren't listed, they're both directly connected to 5G, which was listed under the edge computing section. There are multiple use cases for things like AR and VR across a variety of verticals but technologies can dramatically enhance medical training and patient care. AR enables you to augment an image and create a 3D experience, and VR enables a user to immerse themselves in a 3D environment by using something like an Oculus Rift. An example of this is something like medical training. Current training has shifted from the rote memorization of facts to the imparting of skills to use facts to arrive at a proper management strategy uh, when faced with a given patient. And this includes training, problem-oriented learning, communication skills, and VR-based learning. And VR is also useful in planning complex operations beforehand as neurosurgical procedures, as it helps the surgical team walk through the entire surgery and rehearse their planned intervention. AR and VR, as I said, are passion projects for me outside of work. Uh, and when we see proper backbone 5G infrastructure, we're likely to see a stable connection um, and the development of these technologies explode. I hope this has been an informative and educational talk. Um, as you can see, almost everything that I've spoken about today um, is, sits on the technology landscape and connects to multiple sections. I always say that my role is to answer the questions that customers haven't even asked themselves and to stitch everything together using the most effective needle and the finest thread. I live and breathe technology both inside and outside of work. Um, we set up a dedicated Giant Health distributed email address, so if anyone wants a copy of the slide deck, any of the case studies that I've mentioned with the big tech vendors and the NHS trusts, um, then you can just email and I'll send you the full links. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with Declan Hadley um, at Cisco and get that view from a nurse to NHS to now working in the tech sector, I'm more than happy to broker that, that introduction for you. And if anyone wants to talk about full stack cybersecurity or technology, then you can get in touch. Um, there's some really cool stuff going on in the industry at the moment, things that I don't have time to talk about, um, cloud security, DevOps, AI, data warehousing, all the things that were on the technology landscape. But from a security point of view, you know, secure remote access is massive and every technology vendor is moving to past wordless authentication um, and continuous authentication. And that's whereby we remove the things like multi-factor authentication and passwords and we actually monitor a user's behavior, what we call UEBA, a user entity behavioral analytics, and we're able to build a baseline of each user's behavior, how hard they press the keys on a mobile, the time of space it takes them to put their password in, so that we can build up a baseline. And as soon as that technology detects that a user deviates from that baseline, we can lock out that user and send it to the IT department. And you'll hear a lot about zero trust network access. Um, a lot of vendors will tell you it's easy to deploy. That's their job, they're technology vendors. They'll tell you anything. But in actual fact, it's a paradigm to work towards is a lot of what I've talked about. Um, there's no silver bullet. You need a defense in depth and a layered approach. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. I've got to say there was four things for me that came across there as a CEO of a mission critical systems for the last 25 years. 
Uh, you're getting about 400 emails a day, and you're trying to get through them really quickly. And I remember yep. late one Friday night, uh, clicking on something that looked like a completely legitimate email from yep. one of my colleagues. And man we managed to stop the ransomware ourselves, but it was terrifying. Yep. And then you've got Declan, who's a great friend of mine. As oh, well. he's really? Yeah. Oh, there you De go. Declan wrote, you know, <laughs> for those of you who... What are the chances of that? Well, pretty high. But anyway, <laughs> um, for those of you looking at ICS strategies, he wrote an ICS strategy four years ago, and he published it, and he shared it, and he's absolutely brilliant. And I understand why he's gone to Cisco as well. But the AR and VR stuff, the ability to memorize, learn quickly, and retain something like 80%, after two to three weeks compared with written work, as you've said, which is yeah. like two to three weeks, is, is absolutely phenomenal. And I hope that AR and VR picks up from where yep. um, sort of 3D failed us, because that's what I was yeah, working yeah. seven or eight years ago. I mean, this was an absolute canter through and an, an enormous uh, amount a lot of, of information. Stuff. Anybody <laughs> got any questions for Andy while he's here? He's a mine of information. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a cultural change, not just a technology change. And I think this is where the technology vendors really fail. And look, I'm very good friends with all these technology vendors, but I work in a reseller world where, you know, my role is to work for the customer. Um, and I think, you know, there's rather than just laying technology on top of technology, there has to be a cultural shift and an educational shift in un businesses understanding that process and policies need to change and that innovation can come through both technology but governance and policies. So I think in answer to your question, Marius, I think a lot has to go down to educating